Well, our next song that we'll sing together is one that no doubt many of you will know well. The song is number 141 in your hymnals if you'd like to turn there. The song is The Old Rugged Cross. It wasn't until recently that I knew the story behind the song, but it really was a, a tremendous blessing to me. I thought I'd share it with you this morning. Its author, George Bernard, was an evangelist that traveled during much of the early 20th century. And it was during a stretch in Michigan as he was going from one revival meeting to another that a group of young teenagers began following him everywhere he went. They were not following him because God was working with them. They were not following him because they enjoyed his preaching, but rather they enjoyed disrupting his messages. Every time he would get up to preach, he would look out in the crowd and he would see the same group of teenagers cutting up. They would follow him no matter where he went. This happened for weeks on end. Uh, it started to bleed into months and he was so discouraged by this. Wondering why on earth would these young people do this? What, is, what do they have to gain by doing this? What's the point of doing this? If all that's going to happen is I'm going to get mocked. People aren't going to be able to focus. And then we don't see any change. But it was during a time in God's word in 1912 that George Bernard suddenly was struck with the answer to his questions. As he was doing his devotions, he was uh, really just meditating on, on his uh, knowledge of Christ. And as he did, it hit him that the first thing that came into his mind when he thought of Christ was the image of the cross, the greatest emblem of suffering and shame ever invented by mankind. And he realized in that moment that Christ had been willing himself to take upon him the greatest emblem of suffering and shame ever invented. He left glory so that we could experience glory because of his suffering and shame. When he realized this, uh, George was so moved that he, that he said, you know what, I'm going to go back into these services. I'm going to go back into these meetings. And even if the only thing that comes out of it is that I am left feeling ashamed, I will know that I did for Christ what he did for me to an even greater extent. And someday, just as Christ has promised, I'll trade in my cross of shame for a crown of glory. What a comfort it is as believers to know that Christ took upon himself suffering and shame so that you and I could share with him in glory forever. Amen. Now we have a chance to sing about that. So I invite you to stand with us as we do. We're going to sing all three verses together. Again, number 141, The Old Rugged Cross.
you're here with us this morning. And as we've sung about how God has shown his love toward us, as Austin played on his cello that song, How Great Is Love, maybe you wonder to yourself, you say, I know that other people have talked about God showing his love toward them, but how has God ever shown his love towards me? We're here to tell you the answer this morning. You'll hear it in song in just a moment, but the answer is very simple. God in his great love and mercy saw that each and every one of us, you specifically, me specifically, that all of us were sinners. And that because of our sins, there was a condemnation that we would face. Someday we would be separated from God and spend eternity apart from him in hell. God in his great love and mercy was so moved with compassion for us that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, down to this earth. Jesus lived on this earth for 30 plus years, lived a perfect sinless life, ultimately was crucified on the cross for things he had never done. In dying on the cross as a perfect man, he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. He paid the price for your sins and for mine. He died for all of us and made a way that any one of us, no matter what sins we've committed, no matter how much failure we've, we've faced in this life, no matter how evil we may be, can be saved from our sins. We can be forgiven. We can become a part of the family of God and know that we'll spend eternity in his presence. What a wonderful, wonderful thing it is to know that we have a God who loves us that much. And yet God didn't stop loving us on that day. He loves us every day. Even today, he's shown his love towards each of us allowing us to wake up with breath in our lungs and the opportunity to safely travel here to church, to be here together and to hear from his word being open. Really, we have a God who is so tremendously good to us. He has shown us such great love and he has not left it at word, but he's proved it in action. We have so much to rejoice in this morning. I hope that as we sing the song, if you're a believer, it will cause you to rejoice in your heart, but that if you're here and you're, you've never experience the gift of salvation you've never come to know Christ's love that today you would come to recognize that there's nothing we can do to get to heaven on our own rather we need him and I my prayer is that you would say you know what I need that gift of salvation that today you would come to trust him as your savior and experience that love yourself would you listen as we sing how great is love Yeah. 
if you are thankful for God's love, would you say amen? Amen. amen. So very thankful that mercy chose the path to Calvary. So very thankful he walked that road for you and walked that road for me. Well, we'll dismiss the children at this time. They can be dismissed with our family and our team as uh, they'll head out. And uh, well, they go out the back or the front here. So they'll head out the back and our uh, team will meet you back there and uh, we'll take you. And uh, they'll have special services that Austin <clears throat> will preach to them uh, <clears throat> and preach truth right on their level. And so they'll be excited for that and they'll have some different things going on uh, throughout the week. And so we're very thankful for that. It was uh, probably my turn to jump up and introduce the offering. So sorry for that awkward pause there. And uh, just as far as the offerings are concerned, um, that you uh, your, your regular tithe and offering today was given in the plate. And if you wanted to uh, give to the love offering, just to designate that. And then anything that's designated, that'll go to us this morning. And then probably we'll do the same thing uh, tonight. Uh, that uh, you'll just have to designate if you'd like to give to the love offering and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, I think in its entirety, those will go uh, to us. And so we do have uh, we do have two families that are on the road and we aren't paid by anybody else. We're just completely supported by the love offerings uh, in our churches. And so we've always appreciated your just kind generosity in the past. And, and we just really feel like it's a treasure for us to be here with you uh, this week. We are just so looking forward to our time together and we've just been praying for you, and uh, we're going to see what the Lord will do. If you have your Bible, would you join me in Luke chapter 8? Luke chapter 8. And we're going to take a look, I, I believe, at a very informative passage of Scripture for us. And we're going to deal with this matter of salvation this morning and how we come to know the Lord. And as our Lord was training uh, the disciples, he gave them an instructive passage. Uh, if you look at Luke chapter 8, uh, we're going to begin our reading in verse in verse number one. But before we reread, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us during our time together. Father, thank you for what you want to do this morning. Thank you for the faithfulness of many here uh, throughout the years at Holly Hills that they have just served and and have given of themselves and and sought to seek uh, uh, you uh, in your glory and your kingdom. Father, we just pray this week you would bless them. Would you, Father, encourage those who are just struggling this morning? Maybe just there in the middle of a fiery furnace and a trial in life. Father, I pray for those uh, in the building who are, are just weary and well-doing. And they, they want to see you work. And they, they're walking with you. They're just We don't get tired of the race. We just get tired in it sometimes. And Father, would you just encourage them and give them strength to, to press on. Father, I do pray for the backslider in this room. I pray for the self-righteous sinner that think they have all the ideas. And that it's their way or the highway maybe. Or or that they, your life is just all about them, I pray that you would send a brokenness and that you would reach them and you would deal in their heart as well. Uh, Father, we do pray for those who don't know you, that you would allow the, the uh, uh, Lord, just your love, just to overwhelm them. And uh, Father, I pray today as I lift you up and you draw them into yourself. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for who you are, that you love us so much, that you gave your son that we could spend eternity in heaven with you and have a relationship with you. Father, help us to learn everything out of this passage you would have us to learn. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Would you look at Luke chapter 8, verse 1? The Bible says, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And you know what the glad tidings of the kingdom were? Is that there was a Messiah that was going to come. He was going to live a sinless life, and he was going to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And friend, when Jesus died on the cross, no longer do we have to jump through the 600 flaming hoops of the law. No longer do we have to sacrifice in a temple because the ultimate sacrifice for sin was on the cross, the man Christ Jesus. And the power of God tore down the veil in the temple. And now through the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, we can have direct access to God through what Jesus Christ has done. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world. God just didn't love the world. He so loved it. It's emphatic in the text, and it means that he just went overboard beyond what he ever should have done and just lavished his love upon the world. And that's the Greek word cosmos. That means anybody. It means the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's what love does. Love gives. 
that he gave his only begotten son. The word begotten is the Greek word monogenes, and it means unique, one of a kind. There's only one man who ever walked this planet, ever one time sinned. It's not you, it's not me, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he lived a perfect life. And do you realize that when you trust him by faith and you repent of your sin and throw yourself in the mercy of the Lord and trust in him to save you, do you realize that Jesus will take your sin and God will credit, forgive you, God will credit to your account the perfect life that Jesus lived. Amen. My dad was promoted to heaven about six or seven years ago, about seven years ago. And my dad was not a perfect man. I can tell you as his kid growing up in that home, he was not a perfect man. But because he knew the Lord, he had a perfect standing. And when I get to heaven, the Lord is not going to see the sins of Rondegard, although they are many. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I tell you, if you've been to Calvary, you've been stamped with the blood of Christ. You've been declared righteous. And there is no condemnation to them that are in Jesus Christ. He gives it to them. The scripture says eternal life and they shall never perish. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. Tell you, when you think about heaven and how wonderful and incredible it is, it makes all of our problems down here seem so small, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Listen, you're going to glory one day. Amen. We're going to be with him in heaven. There's no doctors. There's no civil government. We're not going to need that. There's no stage four cancer in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. There's no dementia. There's no Alzheimer's. And we're going to have a perfect body. I'll tell you, you can't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> tell you, I can't wait to see the Lord. These are the glad tidings that the Lord was publishing everywhere he went. And do you realize today you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? The Bible says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know for sure. There are some denominations who are works-based that you have to do, 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 and to know you're going to heaven, that's the height of pride. Listen, God made heaven. Don't you think he knows what it takes to get in there? Amen. It's his house. Of course he knows what it takes to get in there, and he told us. And you know what? And that is the glad tidings that I just shared with you. You know what? If you're going to go with what some religious leader says, or you're going to go with God who made heaven, that's your choice. But I'm going with God who made heaven. I like those odds. Yeah. And he wants to know you. He loves you. You're special to him. He made you. He didn't make junk. You're special to God. And he wants a relationship with you. And these are the glad tidings that the Lord was preaching. And so continue reading in verse 2. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities called Mary Magdalene, called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Remember Mary Magdalene? Listen, if God could change a life like hers or this person out of whom went seven devils, don't tell me God can't change you. Amen. You think you're too wicked to ever be saved? Are you possessed with seven demons? Guess what? God can handle that too. And the Bible says in verse 5, And when much people were gathered together and were come out of him, or were come, were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. This is a turning point in the ministry of the Lord. From this point forward, he just spoke to the crowds in parables. And this was the turning point. And so this is one of the first ones that he ever gave. And what's happening is that he has now the 12 disciples with him. They've heard him preach the glad tidings, but guess what? Now they're going to go out and they're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And the Lord is enrolling them in a class. And we have now the parable of the sower. And so in this parable, you are going to read about four different soils. Would you look at that in verses 5 through verse 8? A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And, upon, and, and some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And so what the Lord is doing is he later gives an explanation that is beginning in verse 10, and he gives an explanation of that parable, basically saying, you know what, guys, you're going to go out and you're going to preach the gospel. Four types of people you're going to run into. 
There are four types of responses to the gospel that you are going to see, and you need to understand what is at work in their hearts. You realize there are four different types of people in this room tonight and your rep or this morning, and you're represented by these parable by this parable of the sower. You are one of these four soils. There's four different types of people living in the world. And they are all represented by these types of soils. Would you look at verse 9? The Bible says that his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. When the, in the Bible, when you read about mysteries, it's not something, a mystery, a spiritual or a scriptural mystery, is not a mystery that you can't understand. It's a mystery that you can understand for the first time. And so he's looking at these disciples and he says, to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. And Jesus is now explaining this, this mystery of the gospel and the church. Listen, they are going to have a greater knowledge than what the Old Testament prophets have. Do you realize this morning as a New Testament believer and a completed canon of scripture that we have a more sure word of prophecy that you have a greater knowledge than the Old Testament prophets did? And what a privilege is given unto us. And so now he begins to explain that parable. In verse 11, he says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. And you know what the fact is? There is nothing wrong with the seed. You're going to have people today try to tell you, oh, the Bible was written uh, by sinful men and the Bible contains errors. This book is perfect. Amen. We have a perfect God who left a perfect Bible, who left a perfect gospel. And there is nothing wrong with the seed. The seed is the word of God, it says in verse number 11. In verse 12, and those by the wayside are they that hear. And he begins to explain it. And so there's nothing wrong with the seed. There is nothing wrong necessarily with the sower. The problem was the soil. In fact, there could be the same kind of, just learned this yesterday, there could be the same kind of grape, the same kind of grape, the same grape, but it's planted in different places around the world. And that grape juice will actually taste different depending on the soil it grew up in. And so really the soil, it does make a difference. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to go through these four different types of soils this morning. And these are people who hear the gospel. And I'm just going to tell you right at the beginning, three of these are unsaved. They are lost. They are people who are unregenerate. They don't know the Lord, but they think they're on their way to heaven. And that's why we need to go through these three soils. The fourth represents the good soil. That is a soil of someone that is saved and who knows the Lord. And so this is a parallel passage. So in verse 5, you have a soil, and it's explained in verse 12. And then you have a soil in verse 6. It's explained in verse 13, 7 and 14, and 8 in verse 15. Look back at this first soil in verse number 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. And in first century Mediterranean living, they would sow by the broadcast method. They would, the, the farmer would have a bag and he would take seed and he would throw it out and sow that seed. He would just throw it out into the air and it would land on the ground. It was the broadcast method. Later, uh, you know, TV and cable and all that, they kind of, radio, they took that broadcast idea and that's where that came from. But they're just throwing it out of the air, just like a TV signal or a radio signal they're throwing out in the air. So he would just sow, uh, uh, he would just sow seed out of his bag. And the farmer knew he had, to, he had to sow more seed than he knew he would really need. I know some farmers, I got some friends that are farmers, and uh, they've got corn, and they just chalk it up every year 10 to 15%. Of their of their crop is going to be eaten by deer. I mean, it's just happens. It's just how it is. Or, or or birds come and eat the seed. So he throws out more seed, really than than what he needs. And really, you can never over seed with God's word, right? We ought to be saturated with God's word. So remember, the seed is the word of God. And really, today this morning, I'm the sower. I'm throwing out the seed. The preacher is the sower. And so in verse 5, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. 
And so number one, this is called the roadside soil. The roadside soil. You see, people didn't walk in the middle of fields because something was planted there. So they would walk on the outer edges of the field. And the more they traveled on the outer edges of the field, the more the ground became compacted and it became hard. And really, this is eventually how the Roman roadway system got started. It was already trodden down and it was already impacted. And so some of the seed fell on the pathways that are on the side of the fields. And the Bible says in verse 5, and it was trodden down and people walked on it and the fowls of the air devoured it. Well, would you look at Jesus' explanation? The disciples are asking, what does this parable mean? And Jesus said, four types of people you're going to run into when you preach the gospel. Here's the first one, the roadside soil, verse 12. Those by the wayside of the roadside are they that hear, then cometh the devil. He's like the bird. And taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be what? Saved. Saved. So we know for sure that this is someone who is lost. It is amazing the deafening silence by commentators as to how actually Satan does this. The devil takes away the seed out of our heart, lest we should believe and be saved. And I believe there are a number of ways, but I believe one way that the devil does that is through distractions. Somebody is sitting in a church service just like this. The gospel is preached. You know that person knows that they're lost, that they're a sinner in the sight of God. They've done some terrible, wicked things they wish they never would have done. And they know maybe as they listen to the preaching that they're on their way to hell. And they are convicted about it. And then you know what happens? Then the invitation is given. Would you trust Christ? Or maybe you have a family member that has explained the gospel to you and they pleaded with you and gave you an invitation. Would you trust the Lord today as your savior? And so what happens is sometimes they think, you know what, we'll all deal with that later. Or I've got some questions. I'll think about that later. Or you know what, I'm looking at my watch. I got to beat the Methodist to lunch. You know, we, we have to go. And, and you know what, I'll just deal with that later. And so what happens is they scoot out the door, they get involved in the business of the day, and conviction begins to slip away. Or maybe at times before they go to bed, God's just dealing with them and thinking about eternity, heaven and hell, and where they'll spend it. And, 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 and God's just dealing with I'll just deal with that tomorrow. And you know what? You explain away conviction, and conviction slips away. I think this could actually happen to Christians. You know how many of God's people sit in a church service and know that there is a step that they need to take? There is a sin that they need to repent of. And you know what? We'll all just deal with that later. Conviction slips away and they are searing their conscience and they're doing it while they're in God's house. I, this is why I give an invitation after every time I preach. There is nothing spiritual about that makes you spiritual when you walk down an aisle and get on your knees. There is something that makes you spiritual when you respond to what God's doing in your heart immediately. The invitation is just a time to facilitate that. Probably, to be honest, I'm more interested in what happens when you walk out the doors and the change that's in your life. But this is why giving an, an invitation is something mystical and magical about it. This is just a time for you to respond to what the Lord is doing in your own heart. I think he does this. He distracts you with sin. We get so involved in the pleasures of this life. And a lot of times the devil is so crafty. The devil will take things that aren't wrong. But we begin to treat those as the main things of life. We follow sports or maybe you have a hobby or, or maybe you like to fish or maybe you like to boat. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But it takes, it, it takes a greater priority in our life. And life becomes all about that. Young people, man, they, they, they get their head in a video game and they can play it for five, six, seven, eight hours at a time. And man, they're just a gamer and that's just what they're into. And, but you know what? It takes a greater priority. And you know what? We begin to love those things more than him. And that's an idol. And the devil throws out all of these pleasures of life that we can get involved in. We're going to look at that in just a moment. 
and 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 you know but i think he does this through distractions and so it's someone that they it's just that their heart is very hard like this roadside soil and when the seed falls on it you know what they don't want anything to do with god it doesn't really penetrate their heart they're so distracted by other things and they have rejected god so many times over and over and over and over again you know what their heart has become so hard listen there's a line the Bible says, my spirit would not always strive with man. There is a line. And it might be different for different people. And I don't know sometimes exactly where that line is, but I'm telling you, there is a line where God says, I'm done. And he's not just this wimp of a God who sits there and thinks, oh, would you please get saved? Please get saved. He's the king of heaven that commands you to repent. Amen. And he is offering you a way to be saved. And maybe you have just done this to God. Well, I'm just going to live my life. And you know what? When I get old, then I'll trust God and, and trust Christ. You know what? You could have 50 years. You could have five years. You could have five minutes. You could be in the presence of Jesus before he hit the parking lot. Amen. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. I was preaching in this town several years ago. We dismissed the church service, I think, at 12.05. You realize that 12 o'clock right in front of the church, there was a fatal head-on accident. If that were tragically to happen today, as you were leaving, where would you go? Maybe have you just pushed God off so many times that your heart has just become so hard and maybe you're getting to that line? This is the roadside soil of somebody that's very hard, even antagonistic against the things of God. And, and we see that they're not saved. That's the roadside soil. And they're so distracted by the devil and other things. But would you take a look now at verse number six? And the Bible says, And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. So this seed falls on the ground. Now, this isn't talking about just, just different rocks that are in the soil. It's talking about a rocky shelf. Maybe there is maybe about 10 inches of topsoil. But right under that, there is just this shelf of rock. I don't know if you've ever try to dig a hole and you came into something like that just this bedrock or this rocky shelf and so what happens is the seed falls in the soil and it tries to put down roots but because the soil is so shallow it can put a sufficient root system down and get the nutrients out of the out of the soil or, or soak up the water and so it breaks forth from the from the from the ground and it has some leaves and it withers away because it lacks moisture. Now, Jesus is preaching to an agrarian culture, giving uh, this agrarian um, illustration. They were well-versed in farming, and they knew this. This would happen a lot of the times. But look at his explanation in verse 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, for a while would believe, and in time of temptation, or trials, or testing. That's the Greek word that's used there. Fall away. We know these people are unsaved because you don't lose your salvation. If you have to work to get it, then you've got to work to keep it. We have a Christ that's strong enough to save you to the uttermost. Amen. And when he said on the cross, it's finished, he wasn't kidding. It's done. Everything you needed for your eternal salvation was accomplished with the Lord Jesus Christ with his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. So this is someone who doesn't know the Lord. This rocky soil, number two, this is called the rocky soil. You have the roadside soil. This is the rocky soil. These are people that have an emotional response to the gospel. Remember what the text said? They received the word with joy. And so this is an emotional response to the gospel. Maybe there was a song service and they just got kind of whipped up into a frenzy and there was a lot of emotion. And maybe there's an emotional illustration that was given or maybe something very, very tragic happened in their life and they're just in an emotional state where they're, they're, they're just, there's just this an emotional response to the gospel but I tell you, when testing and trials come, they fall away. Is the Christian life just a bed of roses? No, we all got trials. 
And so they say, well, I'll just try Jesus like I would try the Atkins diet or try South Beach or I'll just try keto. And they try Jesus like they try a diet. And you know what? They think, oh, well, this doesn't work. And then they throw it off. And, if, and there are no roots of faith and repentance. But can I just tell you, the evangelical world and gospel preaching in America is producing this kind of result and soil. And I'll tell you how, how it happens. We live in a day and an age where there is, there is growing persecution to the gospel. And so what the temptation is, is to take everything out of the gospel that is negative. Anything that deals with sin, that we have broken God's law, that we are a sinner, that we are broken. There is something inherently wrong within us. And that's our heart. And we're all born in the wrong family. John 8, 44, a year of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. And we're all born into the wrong family. And so there is something inherently wrong within us. And we need a transformation of our heart through the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need this transformation. But, but there is just a fear of this, of how the world is going to respond. So they take everything negative out of the gospel to make it more palatable to the secular mind. And here's what they say. Oh, well, do you want love, peace, and joy? Well, then you need Jesus because Jesus is going to give you all those things. And who doesn't want love, love, joy, or peace? And so they try Jesus like they'll try a keto diet. And guess what? Maybe stage four cancer comes to their homes. Or maybe they lose a family member to death or to a disease. Or maybe they lose their job. Or maybe there's financial ruin. And they say, you know what? Everything promised to me, this love, joy, peace, that didn't happen. I guess this Jesus thing doesn't work. And they throw off the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine with me if this room, this auditorium were an airplane. And I, as the, as the, as the steward, I've walked down this uh, part of the airplane, and I, I tell the people on this side of the plane, listen, there is a parachute underneath your seat. Put it on, it'll improve your flight. And then I walk off. Huh. And you're like, well, I don't know how a parachute's going to improve my flight, but whatever, I'm all about having a better flight, so I'll try it. So you reach down, you grab the parachute, you put it on. Well, it's heavy. About 10 minutes later, your shoulders are hurting and uh, it's hot on the plane. You can't really rest comfortably in your seat. The people behind you are going, dude, check out the moron with the parachute. What's his issue, you know? And, and, and about 20 minutes later, you're thinking, this isn't improving my flight at all. So you take it off and put it back under the seat. Well, now I go to this side of the plane and I tell everybody on this side of the plane, listen, there's a parachute underneath your seat. Put it on, it'll improve your flight. But then I give you a piece of information I didn't get the people over here. There is something wrong with the plane. We've already lost engine number one. There's only two engines and that one's already on fire. We are gonna crash. Put on your parachute. It'll improve your flight. <laughs> and you reach down, you grab that parachute and man, you're holding on to it like grim death, right? I mean, 10 minutes later, you don't care that it's heavy. Man, uh, 10 minutes later, you don't care that you can't push your seat all the way back. Man, that seat's going to be in a million pieces in about 20 minutes, maybe. You don't care about the people mocking you because you realize I'm going to have to jump out of a door at 10,000 feet. And if I don't have this parachute, I'm not going to make it. All too often, evangelical Christianity gives the gospel this way. Do you want love, joy, peace? I was doing meetings in Florida in January. There was whole billboards that said this. Do you want love, joy, peace? Well, who doesn't? Put on the Lord. He'll give you all those things. And we remove anything negative about the gospel. Can I just tell you, friend, there is coming a day that you're going to have to jump out of death's door. And if you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it and the Bible says, he that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son hath not life. This is a matter of where your soul will spend eternity. Man, you need the Lord Jesus. And this is just an emotional response to the gospel. There were no roots of faith and repentance. This was just, oh, just an emotional response. But you know what? There was really no faith or repentance. But you look back down 
at verse number seven. Here we see what I like to call the ruined soil, thirdly. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. So the sower sowed the seed, it started to grow, and you know what? The thorns are choking out the plant. Well, now look at Jesus' explanation of the ruined soil in verse 14. And that which fell among thorns, okay, this is the ruined soil, are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, bringing no fruit to perfection. If you are a believer, there will be some kind of fruit in your life. He that began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. There will be some type of fruit in your life. There will be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There will be some kind of bearing of the nine fruits of the Spirit. He has the power to keep you. He has the power to save you. He has the power to change you. This is someone who doesn't know the Lord, this ruined soil. But when you look at three specific thorns that the devil uses, to try to choke out the gospel. Notice what he says in verse number 14. And they which, and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares. Number one, the problems of life. The problems of life. The number one reason that I find traveling the world for the last quarter of a century why people are so antagonistic to the gospel and they reject the gospel and God is because something happened in their background or their past that was very hurtful to them. Maybe they had to bury a child. No parent should have to bury a child. It just doesn't seem like that's the order it should be in, right? Or maybe stage four cancer came to their home. Or maybe a loss of a spouse. You know, it's always harder for the one left behind. Think of my mom and, and you know, my dad promoted to heaven seven years ago. It's always harder for the one left behind. I remember Chris and I, we got in bed one night after a service and, and she kind of looked at me. She goes, you know what? I hope you, I hope I die before you. And lovingly, I looked at her and says, I hope you do too. <laughs> and obviously, I'm teasing. And, but you know what she was saying? That it's always harder for the one left behind. My dad's in heaven, man. <laughs> I don't feel sorry for him. Man, I can't wait to get there. But it's harder for us, isn't it? And we've got to go through with that and the loneliness and the pain and, and, and the grieving. Something happened in their background that was very hurtful. And they blame him. Never one time have I ever heard them blame Satan. They blame God. Are you mad at God this morning? Are you blaming God for something that has happened in your life that was hurtful to you? The devil is getting you to turn your back on the only person who could help you. Well, if God's sovereign and God's loving and God's good, then why did he allow this to happen? Actually, it's called theodicy. It's the theological term for the problem of evil and suffering. If God's sovereign and he's good and, and, and God is in control of all things, then why is there even such a thing as stage four cancer? Then why are there natural disasters that claim the lives of thousands of people every year? I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there was a family that their daughter worked at Chick-fil-A. She was a senior in high school. She was coming home after closing that night and she was hit by a drunk driver. <clears throat> the para, uh, paramedics, the state troopers, they were there within minutes. She was gone. She was saved. She went to heaven. And by the way, you never know when it's your time. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. You think she got up that day thinking, I'm going to go out to eternity today? No. Sometimes we don't think that way. But especially if you're here and you rejected God out of your life, you might want to rethink that. You never know when it's her time. When she was saved, she went to heaven. The mom was saved, but the dad wasn't. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he looked across the table at me, or, or the living room across the coffee table, and he said, Ron, if God really loves me, then why did I have to bury my daughter? Wow. That's tough stuff, isn't it? 
I said, I don't know why God would ever allow that. But I could construct for you tonight a hundred reasons why God was more gracious to take her in a moment's time without her even maybe even feeling anything was so fast. What if she were to contract later a disease and live in incredible pain for 50 years? What if she were to contract an illness or be in another accident, become a vegetable the rest of her life? What if God, knowing, promoting her to heaven at 18, that would be enough to get a hold of her daddy's heart and he would trust Christ and now he would spend eternity in heaven? If God were to tell me some of my family members would trust Christ, if I were to die today, I'll go right now. And the term is called theodicy or the problem of evil and suffering. There's a very long answer to this, but you know what the short answer is? The short answer is simply this. God made everything perfect. Amen. He created man. He said one thing was not good. That man was alone. So he created woman. Adam took one look at Eve and says, whoa, man. And God says, that's what we'll call her. <laughs> and everything was perfect, right? Our first parents, Adam and Eve, they sinned. And the curse fell upon this planet, Romans 5, 12. So that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And this curse and the stain of sin, it poured out upon this world. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, they messed everything up. We've chosen to sin. We messed everything else. We messed everything up too. So God did decide to step in and fix it. But he fixed it spiritually first. By sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross and provide a way that you can be saved, that all of your sin could be removed, and that you'll have eternity forever. And then at the end of the time, at the end of time, God's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth. He's gonna fix everything physically. He just practiced triage. He fixed the most important thing first. He doesn't want you to die and go to an awful place called hell and the lake of fire created for the devil and his angels, but he made a way that you could be saved. And maybe you're that rocky soil, or I'm sorry, you're this ruined soil. And maybe you've been blaming God all of these years, but God is good. He is sovereign and he is just, and he's so much bigger than all of the trials and the hurts in your life. Stop running from him and run to him. Amen. And man, he could save you. He's the only one that can help you. But look at verse 14. There was the there was the thorn of the cares in verse 14. And it said they go forth, they're choked with and they're choked with the cares and the riches. So it's the problems of life, but number two, it's the possessions of life. Thinking, oh, money is gonna make me happy. A millionaire once said, Those who say money doesn't make us happy doesn't know where to shop. There's a man in the Old Testament. He was one of the richest men to ever live. His name was Solomon. And he had all the money you could ever, you could ever want. And you know what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11? He said, therefore, I hated life. You know what Henry Ford said after he made his millions? I was happier doing a mechanic's job. You know what Andrew Carnegie said? Millionaires seldom smile. Hmm. And we think, oh, if I just had, if I just had the bigger, the, the bigger house or the bigger boat or the nicer car, then I'll be happy. No, you won't. It's always going to be something else. But they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. First Timothy chapter six, verse nine and ten. Have you ever heard the man that didn't trust banks and years ago he was on a cruise crossing the Atlantic? And the ship sank and he had all of his money on a belt and he kept it with himself. He jumped in the water. He was beginning to drown because all of the gold and all of the money was weighing him down. And they're like, just take off the belt. It's going to drown you. It's like a, just, a, just a weight that's dragging him to the bottom of the ocean. He loved the money so much. He held on to the possessions and you know what? He drowned and died. And Paul had it spot on what he told to Timothy in 1 Timothy. But isn't that a picture of so many in this world that are just hanging on to money and possessions and those things don't last forever. You can't take it with you. You're going to die, then who's all these things are going to be? Man says, you know, he built barns, filled and built bigger barns. 
And can I whisper in your ear what the Spirit of God whispered in the ear and vein of the New Testament? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Right. Amen. Amen. And you're choked with the possessions. Or maybe the problems of life have just clouded your judgment. Notice what he says in verse 14. And they're choked with the cares and the, and the riches and the pleasures of this life, bringing no fruit to perfection. And the devil uses the problems of life and theodicy to get you to turn your back on him. He uses the possessions of life. But thirdly, he uses the pleasures of life. And you know what, friend? There is fun in sin. There is. The Bible never debates that. But you know what the lie that the Bible debates? That the pleasure of your sin will never satisfy. In 1 Timothy 5, 6, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 22, That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I'll tell you the exact reason why maybe some in this room or some under the sound of my voice or some of our family members or the world out there, why they won't trust Christ is because they know God's going to change them and they're going to give up the sin that they so desperately love. And you know what the fact is? They love their sin more than they love God. Maybe you love your Friday night parties and your drunkenness and your immorality and your sexual gratification more than you love God. Can I just tell you, there is not a sin on this planet that's worth dying and going to hell for. Right. Amen. Amen. There's not worth one. It's all smoke and mirrors. He just gives you a little bit of pleasure just for a moment. And then, man, you pay with the penalty of your soul for the wages of sin is dead. Not you just going to the grave. That's you dying and having a second death and going uh, to hell in the lake of fire for the rest of eternity. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's all just a switch and bait. And maybe you've run to the pornography and you've run to all the sexual gratification and you've run to the drunkenness and, 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 and the substance abuse to escape reality just for a moment. You've run to all these pleasures somehow to deaden the pain in your soul and it's never going to cure it. They call it happy hour at the bar. You go get drunk and just kind of escape reality for just an hour. But guess what? It's happy hour because it doesn't last forever. And the next morning, you got the hangover. And you're thinking, why did I even go do that? But then we just go back to it again. It may not be substance abuse, but it might be cutting. It might be pornography. It might be shopping therapy. You go out there and you just start buying stuff to kind of make yourself feel happy and forget about the pain and the stuff that's going on. And the pleasures of this life. Sin only lasts for a season. And you reject the gospel. And you're lost and you need him. There's the, there's the, the roadside soil, the rocky soil, the ruined soil. But look at the receptive soil. And the lastly, just quickly, verse 8. And other fell on good ground and sprang up fruit and bear and, and sprang up and bear fruit a hundredfold. And look at his explanation in verse 15. But they on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, or agathos, heart. The word honest has the word has the idea of being unmixed. In other words, you don't have all these the seed falls, and you don't have this ground with all these thorns and, and with all these with all, with all these these nettles and, and other things. And and so the seed falls in the good ground, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience, or that means endurance. That means when stage four cancer comes or the trials come or financial ruin or you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter or there are strained relationships in your life, you don't just throw it off because you know you're going to go through death's door. And Jesus is the only one that can help you through these trials so you even grow closer to him. That's why you see Whenever there was persecution against the gospel, it spread like wildfire. The gospel did. Yep. And, in the, and, and, and Nero tried to stomp out the fires of Christianity. You know what he did? He sent burning embers all across the world and they preached the gospel everywhere. And that's why in persecution, the gospel always flourished. Because it was the only thing that could sustain you, a relationship with God. Yeah, C.S. Lewis 
this question, why do bad things happen to Christians? You know what he said? We're the only ones that can handle it. Because we have him. Amen. And the world sees that. And when you're sitting on dialysis or you're sitting getting, getting your chemo treatment and a person is watching you that's getting the same treatment and they think, how could you respond with this kind of bedrock, solid faith and stability? Yeah, there's, there's maybe this trial, but man, there's a bedrock of stability. The world doesn't know how to articulate it, but man, they can see it. And it's the gospel. It's the Lord Jesus Christ living in you. And they may never read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but they're reading your life, Paul, and they see it. And man, it's powerful, and it brings forth fruit with patience no matter what comes. Man, the fruit, they see it, and it grows. And I'm telling you, man, it makes it different. But it's a good and an honest heart. And you know what the point is? Would you just get honest with the Lord this morning? Where are you with the Lord this morning? Are you really on your way to heaven? Yes. Well, preacher, I walked an aisle. Preacher, I filled out a card. Preacher, I prayed a prayer. A prayer never saved anyone. The blood of Jesus Christ saves Amen. you. Amen. The question is, what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anyone in this room, believe it. That means you place your dependence upon him for forgiveness and salvation for whosoever believeth in him. So I'll, be, so I'll never perish but have eternal life has that happened to you or do you just have an emotional response or are you just blaming god for all the bad things that have happened in life have you just gotten so hard against him are you being choked out with the problems and the possessions and the pleasures of this life there are four people sitting in this room but only that receptive soil that's the only one that's on their way to heaven what soil have you been? You realize that you could have walked in this room, the, the ruined soil, the rocky soil, or the roadside soil, but you could walk out the receptive soil. Amen. Amen. The question is, what are you going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? Put him on. He's not just going to improve your flight. He's your only hope when you jump out of death's door. Right. Amen. Would you stand quiet as we pray? Father, thank you. For your goodness to us thank you for such a rich explanation of the gospel and father i pray that you would do your work this morning as heads are bowed and eyes